Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Khachi. Thank you, and thank you for Kali for uh, hosting him today. Uh, I, I like to thank Khachi because he's been uh, following uh, up on my visit uh, in all its details. It's my first to Argentina, anyway. I've only been to uh, Brazil in this part, so it's it's good to be in uh, Argentina. Um, this topic is an academic topic. It's a religious topic, it's a political topic, it's a social topic. For Christians in the Middle East, it is an existential topic. Uh, and let me start uh, in the following way. From a very young age, even when, I, when we were studying, I was involved in interreligious or interchurch types of activities including one of the Middle East Council of Churches, in which all the Catholic, Orthodox, Protestant churches function. The discussion, when we were much younger, I'm talking about the 1980s, early 80s, the discussion of the Middle East Council of Churches and the churches together in the Middle East was how to develop society better, how to serve the refugees where they were, how to train the leaders, and so on. From the early 1990s and on, there was one topic for most of the activities of these churches when they came together. <coughs> or actually, it was two words. It was called Christian presence. So the whole discussion of all the good values of what churches can do together was reduced to this one notion, Christian presence. Why were they discussing this? Because it was thought as early as the 1930s that the very essence and the core of Christian presence in terms of numbers, but also in terms of institutions, efficiency in society, in politics and others, was really being diminished, diminished to, to a degree that it would simply become symbolic if things were less. The way they were. Now I go to my text. And I'll, I'll uh, use my text, but I'll, I will depart from my text and I will reduce it based on the time that I have. So I have chosen a title for today that went this way Is there any role left for the Christians of the Middle East in regional stability and reconciliation? Is there any role? Is there any role left? anything else that Christians would do. The fact that Christians were effective in the Middle East is very, very clear. Uh, very central, very foundational, and all that. What areas? Let me name a few areas where throughout history, throughout Christian history, uh, Christian uh, thinkers, institutions were really driving uh, the way be it in literature, linguistics, the arts, community cohesiveness, communication between East and West. And, and let me open brackets here. Uh, when I say communication with churches East and West, and Christians in the Middle East were playing this role, because as you probably know, many of the leaders of the Christian churches, patriarchates, are found in the Middle East were found in the Middle East. Um, they still are. So, for example, if someone is Syriac Orthodox, any Arabic speaking people here other than that, me and, and Haji, Syrian Orthodox, the world leader of the Syrian Orthodox sits in Damascus. If one is Antiochian Orthodox, Rum Orthodox, they call them, the seat is in Damascus. If, we, if one is a Maronite, including many, many Lebanese, the headquarters are in Lebanon. So when all these patriarchs, all these churches are sitting there, then it's naturally creating a link between the Middle East and the rest of the world. And then you add many other types of churches, including Catholics, many of the Catholics, almost all of the Catholics, will think about Rome. And then if you were a Protestant, then Many parts of Europe, many parts of North uh, North America would be your natural allies, your natural ties. 
So, so when Christians were playing all these roles that I named, including communication with East and West for a long time, I mean, it, it is, you can find so many examples. And in later centuries, and I'm talking mostly about uh, the, the 17th century and on, 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, you have printing presses, publication work, school education, basic schooling, and then higher education, medicine, social work, city planning, not city planning, including the city of Beirut and other cities, ideas of freedom and democracy, concepts of Arab nationalism, human rights, and in many instances, political leadership. So, these are some of the areas in which Christians were playing the key role, or a major role. All this is not to say that in some instances, Christians were not to blame for also problems. One major problem that Muslim communities will talk about all the time is the Crusaders' times. You know, when the Crusaders went all the way to Jerusalem, and on the way they had to do military marches and, and, and military activities, 11th to 14th centuries. And, and in many areas of the world, when Christians and Muslims today sit together for dialogue, and I've been involved in, in a few of these, uh, when you talk about current problems of Islamic radicalism or militancy, immediately someone would raise their hand and they will say, but you know what happened in the Crusaders' times? So that's the card, that's immediately. So I don't want to take only the Christian side. We should say that once in a while you have the cards used by the Muslims because there was an issue there with the Crusaders. Now, so I'm not glorifying all that the Christians did, but you cannot deny that the Christian role in, in the Middle East was this major one. Now, now I go back to my question, the topic I have chosen for today, any role left for the Christians for the future? Should they do anything else? I chose this title. One reason I chose this title is because it's a problematic title. What do you mean, is there any role left for the Christians? I ask myself. So it's a problem. Why should one ask what role we have played in the past? Why should one ask, are we playing a good role today? Or do we have any role left to play? Why should we ask? The question itself tells you that there's a problem. There's a major problem. That we need to justify presence. And here, for any group, for any minority or majority group, here is a foundational problem. When you are put in a position to justify why you exist, where you exist, then that is a major problem. So it's justification in the Middle East today with the largely Muslim communities. An increasing number of whom, that is, increasing number of the Muslim communities, would consider today the Middle Eastern Christian presence as an infidel presence that needs time to convert. And this is not the academic Muslim approach. Of course, it's not the leadership approach. No mufti will say this. No good academician from the Islamic circles will say this. However, on a popular level, that's what I'm talking about, this is the type that, uh, that is used. And I'll give an example. I think that I think it was about 18 years ago, 18 or 19 years ago. I was in Amman, Jordan, for a Christian-Muslim dialogue. In fact, it was a dialogue between the Vatican and uh, Jordanian and other Islamic institutions. I was asked to sit at that meeting, global meeting, to represent the Middle East Council of Churches. It wasn't my job, but I was asked to go, and I went. So I attended uh, two days of dialogue, and then there was a luncheon at the restaurant. Everyone went to lunch, I missed the bus. So I took a taxi. I had a badge. So the taxi driver said, what is that? I said, you know, I'm part of a conference. What is it about? I told him, Christian Muslim dialogue. He said, Christian Muslim dialogue? 
can you explain to me why you need to die alone? <laughs> I said, he said, it's a matter of time. It's coming very soon and we're getting there. You're all either going to disappear or convert. So why do you die alone? You came all the way from Beirut. Okay, should I generalize this? I don't generalize this. Is this an isolated idea? No, this is very popular. And, and I'm, when, I, when I say something is popular, that means my reading of the situation, the popular situation, not only in Lebanon, but also in Syria, in Iraq, in Jordan, in Egypt, will not be very different from what, what I just described. Um, it, it may be unfortunate. So, so the Christians more and more in the Middle East are put in a position to justify why they are still there or why they are still Christian. Now, but then there is another pressure. And that is the pressure of justifying the Middle Eastern Christian presence in the wider world, including the Christian West. I fly to the USA more than anywhere else. Almost every time I'm there, some people will tell me, including Armenians and other Christians, some people will tell me, what are you still doing there? Now, by the way, I'm a president of a university. I do fundraising. I need to raise funds, right, for the university. Now, I go to the USA. When I sit with people and they tell me, what are you still doing there? How can I raise money with people who don't think I should be there? I shouldn't personally be there. I shouldn't institutionally be there. I shouldn't religiously be there. So suddenly you realize, I mean, I, I want you to, to figure this out for Christians in the Middle East, that they not only have to justify in the Muslim circle, now we have to justify in the rest of the world why Christians, what reasons do they have to stay in the Middle East, in the Middle East or in many areas uh, today. It is sad that ignorance of the nuances of the wider world is spreading very quickly. In the Muslim circles, for example, you probably know that Christianity is associated with a Western reality. Now, the fact that most Muslims think Christianity is a Western invention means we have lost the game. Uh, that is, they think that we came from some western area and that's like invaders and then when did this Christianity develop? They wouldn't know the history, of course. No? I'm not, again, I'm not talking about the very well educated, the one who went through university, but I'm talking about the vast majority of the populace. Thus, Christians are to answer their neighbors, their Muslim neighbors, for what history represents. And then if something happens politically with a Western country, the Christians in the Middle East have to answer why that happened. So for example, Iraq, the invasions, or other issues of Iraq. Every time something happened, the Christians of Iraq were supposed to come up with answers and try to say that, you know what, I'm Christian, and then there's a cross on me, and, and however, I don't agree. So they have, everyone had to make a statement. And by the way, if you come to the Protestant world and the Protestant presence in the Middle East, it gets too confusing. I'll tell you how. You know that in the USA, uh, there are groups which are called Christian Zionist groups or evangelicals who side with Israel in a very political way, also biblical way, right? I mean, you don't need to be an evangelical to do this, but there are churches very clearly, who would make a state. So, for example, the, a, a group of 30 American evangelical pastors would visit Israel and then would make declarations. And it will be in all the Arabic newspapers. 30 American evangelicals went here and went there. And then we need to justify that, wait, 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 we are Protestants. But these are not what we are. And da, da, da. So, I mean, imagine everything that happens in the Western world has to have its justification there. 
Okay, enough of this topic, this part of the topic. Let me move on. Probably uh, uh, one of the dangers that we're facing today, in addition to this justify yourself all the time, is the fact that numerically speaking and economically speaking and demographically speaking, uh, things have turned really tragic. Not a thousand years ago, but a hundred years ago, probably around a quarter of the uh, societies in places like, if you collect uh, Syria, Iraq, uh, Palestine, Israel, Egypt, you know, all these areas, uh, probably almost 20 to 25 percent were Christian. So it was a very significant presence in many areas. You had, you had many areas, for example, if you look at Syria, you had whole districts uh, that were majority Christian. You had um, whole neighborhoods in the capital or the bigger cities, um, also in Mosul uh, and other places in Iraq uh, and in some towns in Egypt, where the majority uh, were Christian. And now, the highest estimate I have is 4 to 5 percent, from 25 percent to 4 to 5 percent. I'm not convinced this is a, a good number. I still think it's too high because probably we haven't counted what is still happening in Iraq and Syria uh, as, as <coughs> all, uh, the earliest to leave Iraq and to leave uh, Syria uh, were the Christians. Uh, in significant ways. Now, millions of Muslims left Iraq, millions of Muslims left Syria, but then the percentage of the population in Syria wouldn't decrease the Muslim percentage. So, so what makes my problem deeper is that when you have less numbers, then your economy is weaker, then your leadership is weaker, then your followership is, is, is weaker, and, and let me use one, one other example. The Middle East, Syria and, Lebanon, and Egypt, they're also centers for religious callings. You know, religious calling, that is when young people, uh, men, uh, would want to become priests or go to, uh, to the priesthood or uh, church work. You know where most of these young uh, men who became priests later came from? From the remote areas of uh, Syria and Iraq. This is, these are the two areas where they came from. So if you were, for example, a Chaldean, a Syriac, um, uh, or other type of Orthodox and some Catholic, Iraq was a field from which they came with big numbers. If you were Armenian Apostolic, if you were Syriac Orthodox, um, you came from the villages of Syria. So now what the churches will face in the coming generation is that the number of callings uh, into the church priesthood will decrease. Now, the Middle East is a cradle of <coughs> so many civilizations. It is not only civilizations, it's the three Abrahamic faiths. The three Abrahamic faiths shared a lot together, but unfortunately, if you look at the three religions now in the Middle East, they do not look like they have shared much. They do not share much. Um, today, almost all the countries of the Middle East are moving into radical Islamic majorities. In Israel, the situation on the Jewish side is also difficult on a, on a political level, not only on a religious level, so it makes it difficult for the Christians as well to, to exist there. Uh, but then I would like to remind you that there are also lot, uh, lots of other small religious groups in the Middle East which have been losing ground over the past centuries. I'll use some. Baha'i, Zoroastrians, Druze, Samaritans, Is Ismailis, uh, Yaz uh, Yazidis, and, and the others. Now, when the war in Syria started, by the way, and I should say that I was following uh, what was happening in Syria uh, on a daily basis. Kachi would know. 
on a daily basis, I was in touch with the, all the churches and the communities with visits, uh, but also personal contacts with all of them, trying to see what was happening. And I was, I, 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 I already was sensing the change in Syria before the war started. And I'll give uh, this example. Uh, so my father-in-law uh, was in Aleppo, working in Aleppo. And he had a garage, uh, that his garage would fix tractors uh, around the city of Aleppo. So tractors of farmers would come and his garage was serving. And he was telling me before the Syrian crisis started, the war started, that in the past 10 years, year after year, all his neighbors are becoming more and more radical to the extent that the young boys he trained to be good mechanics, now they do not accept their boss. They worship him. He was their hero. Mr. George, he was their hero. He said, now they cannot tolerate my presence with them. This is not after the Syrian war. Now, I should take one more step and say that part of this was after the Iraqi invasion. Because immediately, the PR in Syria uh, turned against Christians. So what was happening in Iraq was translating against the Christians in Syria. Okay, so where's the, where's the fiercest danger? In the Middle East and, and I will say the rest of the world. It is when the majority Muslims do not recognize any Christian by person. Personally. That's the most dangerous place we reach. In cities of Syria, in villages of Syria, most Muslims had something to do with the Christian. When it got to a point when most Muslims had nothing to do with any Christian, then the problems deteriorated. This would be true, by, by the way, for any situation in the world. Any situation. Um, and then the Muslims would victimize the other very easily, and then uh, Islamic uh, groups would, would, would spread very quickly based on only one religious rhetoric, the Islamic um, evangelistic type of rhetoric. I'll give, I'll give one interesting example. So, uh, in the year 2004, uh, part of the Islamic groups invaded a small Armenian town in Syria. It's called Kesa. So they invaded, and the first one of the first areas they took was the Armenian Protestant Church because it's in the center of the town. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's huge. It's the biggest, and it's right in the center. So they did their PR videos for Islamic recruitment from that church, where someone would come and say, some fighter would say, look what. God, our Allah, has given us all these riches, all these lands, and these infidels, these strangers, that is the Christians, the Armenians, huh? by the way, who have been there for a thousand years, um, they are gone and look what land God has given. Now, you know, uh, if an educated Muslim watches this, they will not believe it. But the vast majority who don't have any access to anything Christian, will really believe this. And this is the most difficult point for me in Christ, the Christian presence in the Middle East. Why was Lebanon, for example, highlighted as a positive example in the Christian Middle East? Because more than 300,000 students, many of whom were Muslims, were studying in Christian schools. So every Muslim who was going through a Catholic school, for example, Maronite school, Orthodox school, had a personal knowledge of what the Christian was. Uh, now that in the Middle East the numbers are, the, are decreasing, institutions are closing, the Muslim-Christian contact is decreasing in any positive way, then the Christian is the one on the other side, and the Christian is Christian Muslims on different sides. Now, let me let me go to my last part and say why 
why I think Christians are still needed in the Middle East and why I think there is still a major role to play. Very simply, the simplest version would be the following. It is in the soft policies that the Christians are needed in the Middle East today. Not in the hard, not in the hard wall, not in the big games. The big games are behind us for Christians. That is governmental rule, big political leadership, economic power, um, connections, making Muslims be connected with the West. All these roles have disappeared. The Muslims do not, read, lead, do not need the Christians to create links with the West. The Muslims are everywhere. So they, they will do their own. The Muslims do not simply need education because they have their educational institutions. So they will educate their own. But everything else that is on the softer side, and one of them is education on diversity. Now, only the Christians will be able to do this in the Middle East and other soft matters. I think technology is uh, taking over uh, many things. But technology will not anytime soon take over the development of the soft skills that uh, the Christian spirit, the Christian message will be able to give. Um, I'm not hoping that the future role of the Christians in the Middle East will in include the big influences. It will be the qualitative difference, the spirit difference. Now, I, at our university, by the way, 50% of the students are Muslim. So as I speak, 50% of my students are Muslim. And why is it that they have come to appreciate what we are to offer? We're the only Armenian-owned university in the whole diaspora. There's nothing else. And we're very Christian. Everyone knows. Everyone knows I'm a reverend. Uh, we start uh, our major events with a Christian prayer. And then 50% are Muslim, Muslims. Why do they like it? Well, we've talked with our students about this. And I think what I'm going to say is the type of roles that Christians in the Middle East are yet to play. Uh, they say that your type of faith is not legalistic. Your type of faith pays attention to every single individual, every single personality. You are creating avenues of peace. You are creating bridges amongst people, even if they don't like each other. And let me continue. All these softer types of for this role to be played, I believe that Christians have to be still empowered in the Middle East. I believe Christians today in the Middle East are not being empowered. Christians in the Middle East today are not being empowered. They are being put in a disadvantage from East and West for the reasons that I explained. And I'll tell you, this world will be a more dangerous place without the Christian soul in the Middle East, without the Christian presence of the, the quality that I was describing. Not as a power, but as one that softens power. And I think that's, that's the role that we still have to play. I have lots of other things on my paper, I will not say them. I'll stop here. I think I said enough, I gave enough ideas. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you.